For 14 years, my wife had been pressing me to get a dog. And for 14 years, I'd been making excuses because I didn't want one. And we moved into this new place that had a little yard. And my wife said that she was tired of hearing excuses. So I knew that I was going to have to turn up the heat if I was going to shut this down. So I told her, I've never said this to you before, but when I was a little boy, my babysitter had this old dog that savagely attacked me without warning. <laughs> Threw me around like a rag doll. Its fangs broke my skin and I bled everywhere. But the worst part was, when my mom got there, the babysitter said, John teased the dog, and that's why he got bit. And my mom believed her. And my wife just looked at me and she said, well, when I was a little girl, I dreamed I was gonna be an astronaut and marry a rich man and live in a big house with lots of children and a puppy. But unlike all those other dreams I used to have for my future, I'm getting the fucking puppy. <laughs> and that was the chain of events that led to us rescuing a black lab puppy named Keats. Now, I've never had a dog, never liked dogs, never understood dog people until the morning after Donald Trump was elected. Because I learned that dogs are amazing if you're trying to recover from horrific trauma. <laughs> Keats just curled up at my feet and he looked at me like, don't worry buddy, we'll nominate a progressive candidate next time. And that's how I fell in love with this dog. I even gave him a nickname, Biscuit Baby. And I love me some Biscuit Baby, y'all. But uh, almost overnight, Keats doubled in size into like pure muscle. And the way his chest puffed up, my wife and I thought he might be part pit bull. And one night she was taking him for a walk and uh, the neighbors were putting their kids into their minivan and Keats tore off after them. And my wife couldn't hold him back. And he got right on top of those kids and he started barking so hard he lost his breath. And he was jumping up at their little faces like he wanted to shred them off. And it took three adults to separate them. And when my wife got home, she was as pale as a sheet because she was sure Keats was gonna kill those little kids. And this is how Keats acted every time he got within 30 feet of a child. And my wife and I knew we couldn't keep a dog that might hurt a little kid because we can't afford that kind of litigation. <laughs> so we went to a dog trainer for advice and she told us, well, have someone give your puppy a treat pet him on the head, and then say, good boy. But it's really important, they say it just like that, with lots of enthusiasm. Well, that sounded pretty simple, except my wife and I don't have any children, and that makes meeting children harder. <laughs> you see, people with kids mostly hang out with other people with kids, not childless couples like us that make them feel guilty at how fulfilling their lives are. <laughs> but uh, I still had to get Keats around children. But every time we would go on a walk and we'd see a little kid, Keats would freak out and then the parent would take their child away from us. <laughs> now, after weeks of not making any progress, and after a particularly bad walk where Keats barked at a little kid, my wife started crying because it all seemed so hopeless. And on top of that, she was about to go on a long 20-day trip to a writer's colony. So I made a deal with her. I told her that when she got back from her trip, if Keats was still aggressive to children, we'd return him to the rescue. But 
after she left and the 20 days started dwindling down, I got kind of frantic because I realized that no parent was ever going to let Keats near their kid. So I came up with what seemed like a very logical if-then statement in my mind. If the parents of the children weren't going to let Keats near their kids, then we were just going to have to find an unescorted child. <laughs> like maybe one that had been separated from a larger group of children. Uh, but uh, in today's world of helicopter parenting, uh, it's very difficult to find unattended children. But one day, uh, I was taking Keats for a walk uh, over to the rich people's neighborhood because uh, I didn't want him to think that the dogs over there were better than him. And as we were walking through the woods to get there, we came across these two eight or nine-year-old brothers all by themselves. And I thought, ooh, they're perfect. And... Uh, uh, you know, they were, they had these like little dirt bikes and their baseball caps were turned sideways. And like, if the artist Norman Rockwell had made a portrait of these two kids, he probably would have titled it Stragglers. <laughs> uh, so I started shoving treats into Keith's mouth and I just whispered to him like, you know, this is it, man. This is your big chance. Be a normal. And I just walked up to the two kids, and I was like, hey, guys. Uh, my name's John, and uh, this is my puppy, Keats. Uh, and Keats is scared of little boys. So I was wondering uh, if you'd give him a treat, pet him on his head, and say, good boy. But you have to say it just like that. Well... The older brother was suspicious. <laughs> but the younger one took a treat. And uh, he slowly started reaching his hand towards Keats. And Keats stayed calm. But that got me excited, you know, because it was finally going to happen. You know, this little boy was going to pet my puppy. But... Uh, but uh, I don't know if it was like the look on my face or the way I was vigorously fishing for dog treats in my front pocket. <laughs> but the older, the older one grabbed the younger brother's arm and he said, we have to ask our mother. And I was like, hey, I get it. I understand how the world works, you know? Why don't you guys go ask your mother and uh, we'll just wait for you here in the woods. Uh, but, uh, but after a little while, they didn't come back. And uh, I got, uh, you know, I got upset because, you know, they were just going to ditch us here in the woods without petting Keats. So we went out after him. But uh, we saw him way down the street riding their bikes away from us. And the younger one just looked over his shoulder and he saw us. And he stopped, and he had this, like, conflicted look on his face. And I think it was because, like, he was told to always be polite to adults, but he wasn't 100% if that applied to me. <laughs> but he turned back towards us a little bit, and he said, and he yelled, and yelled back to us, our dad says we can't play with your dog, which was a lie. So I yelled back, you said you were going to ask your mother. And then we just walk back into the woods. Um, but uh, my wife says I'm not allowed to walk Keats that way anymore because <laughs> I'm on some kind of list. But I told her, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Those two boys seem pretty scared to me. Uh, I don't think they're going to tell anybody about what happened in the woods. <laughs> but, you know, it was progress. And Keats stayed calm. And uh, it gave us faith to keep him. And so he's still my biscuit baby. But from time to time, 
he still barks at little kids, and so my wife hope, uh, I hope that um, he'll get more chances to learn. So if you're the parent <laughs> of little kids, uh, maybe don't be so overprotective. Uh, because I'd like to believe that there are a lot of individuals out there, like me and my puppy, that are desperately trying to get close to your children. And they call